Last year, this field was in corn. And we did the full AEA program. I told you on that little pivot over there, I did 192 bushels, 50 units a in. This was identical application, except this only did about 75 bushels. Tell you the difference in the water. I had six and a half gallons on that pivot. I've got three and a half on this. So last year was a horrible year for corn, unless you had the water to make up for it. And if your pollination timing just happened to be wrong, it was real bad. Yeah, pollination was, was about 107 degrees, 30 mile an hour west wind. Um, how, how it survived, I don't know, but when anyway. When did you plant last year? Huh? When did you plant the corn? April 20th. Okay, so it was an early plant. Yeah. Um, but it was a full AEA, followed it up with cotton. It's been a full AEA this year with the primer and uh, infurrow at planting. Uh, we've done two or maybe three foliars. Um, just two, I think. Going along with the saps and, you know, putting what's needed. One thing I've kind of noticed this year is this field is a different color than all the other cotton fields I have or anybody else's cotton fields. And I get tons of questions. How come, how come that's a different color? So. Is it lighter or? Lighter. lighter. It's lighter green. Just, you know, off 84, you can see it in the distance. They think something else is growing here than cotton. And then you come up here and it's cotton. And it's just a different. That's just because it doesn't have 200 units of N. They don't have any. <laughs> zero this is N's zero applied, applied nitrogen. Year. Is it Delta Pine? Delta Pine, 1822. You know, Delta Pine cotton always seems to be yellower than yeah. Max. Well, so, so that brings up what we're going to see. And obviously, we're talking about it here. We'll see it in the next couple of fields also, where we have traditional and AEA treatment side by side color is the thing that that most people bring up and it's and it's very disturbing to people as they're trying to understand what they're seeing because the the old farmer rule of thumb is that doesn't look quite as green as it should let's put some more nitrogen on nitrogen's cheap let's just add another 10 gallons and so what we're actually validating with sap analysis again is that it doesn't need nitrogen and so at the very least we should consider if we don't like the color maybe that's not a problem but even if it is a problem and the plant's saying it doesn't need any more nitrogen adding more nitrogen is only going to be utilizing a resource number one that we don't need and number two that's contributing to many more problems that we're trying to avoid so why would we want to do that and so that that leads right into where we started the conversation this morning of understanding that oftentimes we're our own worst enemy. So we need to learn how to do the things that are contributing to our success and the success of our soil rather than doing what we think or what we have been taught or what our eyes are telling us rather than what the crop is really telling us. Mike, and so, I, I just want to make sure I got this straight. You applied 50 units of nitrogen on the corn last year and no nitrogen this year? Correct. And how does the crop look compared to other crops in the area? Other than the color, um, it, I don't, it's not as loaded as some of the, I guess, it seems like the traditional crops that always are high yielding in this area don't seem to be doing as well. But some of that aren't usually yielding, they're fantastic. So a lot of those crops is missed out, especially some of the dry land, it's loaded up more than what this is. But, you know, nitrogen applied compared, you know, don't know if that's the, the only factor. Well, and the other question there also is, I think what a lot of people on the high plains are seeing that I hope causes them to question a little bit is that our organic fields and our non-irrigated fields look better and potentially have more yield potential than our traditionally treated irrigated fields. So. What have we been doing under extensive irrigation that is contributing to the lack of performance in the season that we've had that's allowing these lower input or virtually no input crops to be performing much better? And so all of that to say, you know, we've, we've got to be able to, to understand what we're witnessing and be willing to maybe change our mind about something that we have believed to be true that's not based on what our fields are actually showing us and telling us and so that you know again these fields have traditionally had the same kind of things that other fields have had historically but we're beginning to see that even in shifting 
the system, we're not really having big problems and, and we know that the future is much brighter. Whereas those other systems seem to be, you know, they've, they've had their heyday, if you will, and, and now things are getting worse and worse and worse. And then even when you do get the, the exceptional weather year that you've been waiting for, why is it not producing what you thought it should? And, and what's standing in the way of that? And so that's, again, we, we've, not been, we've not been what I would consider really aggressive on this field with our treatments. You know, Mike has done a, a great job with primer and the in-furrow treatment. And so when we talk in-furrow treatment, what we're really looking for there is biological stimulation, small amount of micronutrients to make sure that plant is getting as a seedling what it really needs. And then we're gonna come back and see what the plant's telling us 20, 30, 40 days down the road, and then evaluate from there based on what our weather is, what the crop is doing, and what the saps are telling us, how are we gonna manage from there? It's not a, it, it's not a typical program of we've got $80 to spend or we've got $150 to spend, and here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna do this at this time, and this at this time, and this at this time, instead of no, we're gonna let the crop and the conditions tell us what it needs and we're gonna manage according to a budget that we're going to utilize based on when and how the crop needs it instead of let's throw it all out there and hope that it works. If you would like, it's easy to turn this, this crop dark green without nitrogen. Yeah. Yeah. So what makes a plant dark green is the increased chlorophyll content. So we're familiar with, we put on a bunch of nitrogen, we get this increase in chlorophyll, everything turns dark green. But you can do the same thing by putting on more magnesium or more iron than the crop requires, or the combination of the two. And in fact, if you go to different uh, crop types, let's say, if you go to the turf industry, for example, if they want to turn a, dark, a golf course really dark green, they spray it with iron because it does the exact same thing as a nitrogen application does, but without all the surplus growth, which is something they care about. So. The key part to all of, to each of those is that, so you can turn plants dark green with either nitrogen or magnesium or iron, but for any of those to have those, that effect, you need to apply more than the crop actually requires. That's the key phrase. You need to apply more than the crop actually requires, and then it turns that really nice dark green color. So interesting terminology that, I, that when I was introduced to you know, similar technology to what we are really fine tuning now, is that was presented to me as, that's a nice growing green color rather than an over nitrified color. Because what we were accustomed to was excess nitrogen. Yep. A nice growing green is, is more, it's more in the direction of a lime green. It's not lime green, but it's, it's not that deep, dark, black green that everybody is accustomed to. And again, that's, that's management practices that we've just been conditioned to think the wrong way um, that's been very good for an industry that's supporting us in our wrong thinking. But we can walk out in here and, and have a look. Um, we've got a nice load. One of the things Mike mentioned when we were out here a few days ago in regard to, you know, as we all know in cotton, kind of the traditional rule of thumb has been it doesn't really matter how much you put on it, it matters how much you can keep on it to get to the gin and cotton historically sheds a lot of fruit late in the season. We attribute that to, you know, drought stress or run out of energy, run out of gas, got hot, you know, all kinds of things. And, and my contention has always been, I don't think the plant puts on more fruit than it intends to finish. What are we doing that's preventing it from finishing what it intended to do? And how can we manage that in a way to keep more on there? And so Mike, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think you said the other day that this does not seem to be shedding late season like some of the other yeah. stuff that appeared to be loaded more. It's shedding more than what this is. And so we still, you know, the tail will be what's at the gin and what's the quality. Do you have any PGRs on this field? Zero. Zero. Yep. What cover? What cover? Yeah. It was a... Uh, Multi-mix, barley, cereal rye, black oats, radishes, some vetch, uh, a couple of clovers. Mm -hmm. Did you use traditional burn down methods or yeah. how'd you kill it? Uh, just burn down. Did you graze it? Too, and I grazed it. 
Actually, uh, once we harvested the corn, I, 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 I spread it and we turned cows out and they actually planted it for me. And then once we took the cows off in February, I cranked the pivot, got the cover crop going and then I terminated it. Mike and I had that discussion, you know, where do you really want this crop to be cut out? Well, basic rule of thumb is we need 50, 50 pretty good days to make a bowl that's viable. And so that, that leaves us with a, you know, first part of September, depending on what you call your last good day. You know, we want the crop to be cutting out because spending any more energy to put on more fruiting positions that are not gonna make is just energy that's not being utilized to size and mature the, the fruit yeah. that's on it. Did you run an accelerator or boron? We didn't run, I don't think we ran any boron because we were, I mean, other than what we're getting in a couple of blended products, like, so it's got photomag on it, so we got some boron there. We didn't actually push boron because we felt like where we were at in cutout and the amount of time that we had left in the season, we weren't really trying to accelerate it. Yeah, I mean, so we could use, you know, we could seemingly use boron to accelerate that sugar movement to the seed if we were coming up against the end of the season that we were trying to accelerate. But good open weather for, you know, what looks like the remainder of this month that we really need to finish this crop, we just left it alone. But it, it did have two applications of accelerate and photomag and a few other micros. And so I don't think we added any boron because we, you know, I don't think so. We weren't in the tank, but we haven't really tried to push that boron level up either. How much total water down here? Do you know? I don't know. How, How much, much what? Total water. Uh, about six inches. And that was the other thing that was kind of weird is I have a moisture probe. Water just kept showing like it was, it didn't need it. So, you know, in which we got some timely rains, but I ran this pivot six passes, you know, an inch each time, but usually you don't run it and kill it, wait a couple days, recrank it. So that was kind of strange this year. So what's your plan after harvest? Are you gonna come back with more, like more biology or humates or food for the biology? Or? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, I'll plan a, a cover, just, just do a simple grain uh, mixture. And then uh, we'll do a, it'll be cotton next year again. So we'll just start it over again. Try to do the primer a little, a little earlier. Graze the cover crops too? <sighs> Probably, yep. The problem with our season in grazing where you have cotton, if you haven't come in here and got those covers established pre-harvest. Right. So some guys are really pushing the limit on, you know, how, how soon can we get a cover established back into that cotton crop to finish yeah, up the season. Graze, we typically, the only grazing that you generally get if you drill behind the cotton is spring grazing. And most people that want to graze are not gonna invest in transporting livestock for, you know, 40 to 60 days, right. so. How soon before you plant your cotton did, do you terminate your cover? It varies. I, five different fields, I'll do it five different ways. It, it's, it's like you're a, coach calling a play depending on what the stage is at and what the cover looks like what the variety was how thick it is when, when your plant date's going to be what's the range look like anywhere from 30 days prior to two or three days after i planted green before or a burn a burn down application you know after. I know we're from up by mule would probably be a little bit colder but that's one concern is not letting your ground warm up you know, if you have a good, nice cover on it, it's gonna be quite a bit cooler. Well, I've seen that, but if, say you do it seven days before, it seems like you don't get that temperature, but if you go ahead and plant into that living cover, that temperature's higher than seven days after termination. So it's kind of one of those deals where if you waited too long, you might as well just plant into it and then kill it. And cotton comes up a whole lot easier in a bunch of green than it does, you know, a bare field or, you know, a dead field. And then you also got to worry about bugs. 
you have a bunch of bugs in your cover crop, you kill it, and you don't have enough time for them to get out, then they're going to attack that cotton plant coming up. So it kind of depends on the bug pressure. Conversation that Mike and I had on the way out here, um, kind of interesting. Mike mentioned that he's observed on a pivot where you didn't have enough water, right? So you stopped using half the pivot for 10 years and it was just resting, grazing and whatever. And four years ago you took it back into production and he mentioned that even now he can see to the line where the field was in continuous production for 10 years or where it had rested for 10 years. And so I had to ask the question, that, or it, it kind of, for me, I was like, what changed in the soil profile, what changed in the biology to have that long-lasting effect over multiple seasons? Was it, what effect did the nitrogen applications, the herbicide the, that that side of the field didn't have for 10 years to allow the biology a better chance and then to take it a, a step farther, what will the field that, if we continue with the conventional excessive nitrogen herbicides and whatever, if we continue on that path another 10 years, how much more degraded will this soil be than here? If we look at the, the sequence of things. Well, I can comment to that a little bit. There's a group of farmers that a colleague, Michael McNeil, has been working with in Iowa that they, they were early adopters of using anhydrous ammonia, uh, using Roundup Ready corn, using all this various technology. And uh, they l literally hit the brick wall, the figurative brick wall, if you will. This is now 2000, I think it's like five or six years ago, where it used to be that they could put corn seed in the ground and do almost nothing and harvest 200 bushel per acre corn. And then we're talking four feet of black topsoil. And they dropped from that to doing 70 bushel corn no matter what they did. They couldn't apply enough products to get it beyond 70 bushel. So they, they reached that threshold where their soil had degraded enough that it was not able to support a crop anymore. And this was in Iowa. And um, they were able to turn that around after a couple of years of cover cropping and, and regenerating the soil. But it, it, was, it was really an eye opener for me. Like they, they had embraced this technology wholeheartedly and gone down this road. They were early adopters. And how is it possible that perhaps a lot of other soils are on the same pathway, but they're just 10 or 20 or 30 years behind? It was an interesting experience.